A stateless child is born every 10 minutes, meaning that it, no, let us say he or she, these are humans, meaning that he or she has no nationality, no access to the most basic rights. Why in this day and age are so many people stateless? You're watching Roundtable. The United Nations Refugee Agency wants to end statelessness by 2024. And last month, Kyrgyzstan became the first ever nation to achieve that goal, giving citizenship to thousands of people who had previously been displaced. Can that example be replicated worldwide? 10 million people around the world are stateless. They're not citizens of a country, they have no nationality, and often lack basic human rights. The reasons are manifold. Wars, ethnic or religious discrimination, and political persecution, for instance. To combat this, in 2014, the UN's Refugee Agency launched the I Belong campaign. This goal was to end statelessness within 10 years. Kyrgyzstan became the first country to meet that goal, giving 13,000 people citizenship in five years, people who'd been left stateless after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Colombia is also making strides, with plans to grant citizenship to more than 24,000 children born there, to parents from crisis-hit Venezuela. But there are many still left without a country. More than one million Rohingya, for instance, are still fleeing brutal military action in Myanmar, and more than five million Palestinians remain stateless. These are just a few. Can we end their statelessness? Could the Kyrgyz example be replicated around the world? Very pleased to say that on the line from Geneva, we have Melanie Kana, who's chief of the UNHCR's statelessness section. We travel to Australia, to Canberra, the capital. Julia Harrington ready joining us there. Uh, she is the director of Equality and Inclusion at the Open Society Justice Initiative with me in the studio. Pleased to say we have Jawad Ferus, former Bahraini MP who was stripped of his citizenship in 2012 and is still stateless. And we have Amal De Chiquera, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. Massive long introductions, but you're all experts in this field. You, uh, Jawad, from a, a personal point of view. Um, so let me come to you first of all, if I may, Melanie. Um, this idea of ending statelessness by 2024, five years' time, 10 million people. Great that Kyrgyzstan's doing it. Great that Colombia may be doing this for Venezuelans. But it's an impossible task, isn't it? <clears throat> well, no, it's not an impossible task. And, and thank you for having me on. As you know, at UNHCR, we're best known as the refugee agency, but we also have the global mandate to prevent and resolve statelessness. And we were given that mandate by the General Assembly in recognition that statelessness is fully solvable. It's actually much more readily addressed than the refugee problem. Um, the, the way that states resolve statelessness is to provide nationality to stateless people on the territory, as mm. Kyrgyzstan just did, and also to incorporate best practices into their nationality. Oh, oh, okay, um, and exactly. I understand it's a noble sentiment. Sorry to interrupt you. Very noble sentiment, and it is achievable. You, but you have to persuade people to do this, and an awful lot of countries are unwilling to do so at the moment, Absolutely. as we'll hear from Jawad in just a moment. So this isn't going to happen by 2024, is it? Well, it's a matter of political will. We've seen quite a lot of achievements since we launched the campaign, including 20 new accessions to the statelessness conventions, tens of thousands of people getting nationality every year. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. There's a lot more that needs to be done. We're actually going to have a high-level event here in Geneva in October that we hope will galvanize momentum. We hope to see an acceleration in achievements. But it is fully possible. OK, I will ask you a little bit later about the statelessness conventions. But, Jawad, let's get your personal story. Allow, allow me to sum up. Tell me if I'm right or wrong with this, and we'll ask you about what effect it's had on you. Uh, you were an opposition MP in Bahrain. You were part of the protest movement. 2012, you traveled to London. And while you were out, the government or the ruling people in Bahrain who disagreed with everything pretty much that you said, said you're no longer a citizen of this country. I think that's accurate. There are obviously other details in it. But, what effect has it had on your life? Yes, thank you um, 
to bring on the, this important issue uh, to discussion today, exactly what you said. And it was so surprised to me that it was not through the court, and yet I don't know the reason, and there is no justification has been given yet. It was just through a decision by Minister of Interior, and now it was 2012, and now we can say seven years passed, and still I'm ch challenging the government to bring any evidence. It has a lot of uh, side effects. Uh, I uh, consider it as it is a rise of rights. When you lose your nationality, you will lose the rest of your rights. It's related to the, your political and civil rights. Your own uh, properties will be confiscated. At the same time, you will be sacked from your job. You cannot travel. You cannot uh, give a nationality to your newborn baby. You cannot have access to your bank accounts. Uh, um, you will be without any ID. In a way, sometimes they say that you should find any local citizen to sponsor you but no one can sponsor you because you don't have any ID. And most painful that if you don't have any other nationality, which is like me, I born as Bahraini, my parents were Bahraini, and by sudden you will be uh, stripping of your basic rights. It is really painful. How do you travel? Uh, I applied for political asylum. I got it here in the UK. So part of getting the political asylum, you will get a travel document. So now I am having now travel documents. I am traveling with that. And, and are you hoping, I mean, clearly your, your number one wish would be to, to get your nationality back. But are, are you hoping, um, if you remain stateless, that the British authorities will give you citizenship here? I'm in I, want to, I want to find out what other countries are doing when people who are stateless arrive. Okay, I'm, I'm in process in that. I recently got a permanent residency. Will eligible me within a year. I can apply for a citizenship. So by next year, I'll be eligible to apply for a citizenship here. Okay, so, so I, I don't mean to belittle your position, but you are, in a sense, one of the lucky ones, aren't you? Because there are so many more, so many millions around the world. Um, um, Julia, we'll, we'll come to you first of all on this one, then come back to the studio. There are so many more millions around the world who have no recourse. That's correct. Um, what I think is the most striking and thing about citizenship that's usually not properly understood or covered is that your citizenship is not protected in the same way your liberty is protected. So um, the government doesn't generally have to prove that you're not a citizen as in the case we just heard, many states make extremely arbitrary decisions to take someone's citizenship away. And you have, in many cases, uh, verification exercises whereby people are told they have to prove their citizenship to the government. So you can't be thrown in jail uh, under human rights norms unless the state proves that you're guilty. And yet people lose their citizenship all the time yeah. without any kind of judicial process so or even having the burden of proof on the state. The burden so, is so on... So Jawad here is getting some yeah. help. Um, he's able to travel. You've recently been to Lebanon. I don't know about any other holidays, tra business yeah, yeah. travel that you actually have. But what about... Let, let's focus in on one group that's often in the headlines. What about the Rohingya people? Um, Myanmar, Bangladesh, neither side wants to, do, to take them on. Um, where do you try to solve a problem like that? Well, you have to solve it um, as, uh, well, at the level of political will, because um, legally the Rohingya are from Myanmar. They're Myanmar citizens. So the state uh, did effectively denationalize them by saying that they weren't Myanmar citizens or by changing the law repeatedly uh, to take away their citizenship. But uh, what we need is recognition that this is a simply uh, a human rights violation that shouldn't be permitted. I mean, imagine that the, the, what chaos would ensue if every country decided to do that. So um, unfortunately, it's a bit of an epidemic because we haven't got strong remedies. Um, the individuals themselves as individuals can usually not do much if their state is going yeah, to be... Yeah, but equally, equally there, are, there are countries that are burdened with this. And, and, exactly. and I'm, I'm terribly sorry to sound so brutal about it, people being a burden, but there are countries that are burdened with this, and Bangladesh being one of them is being asked to take on the responsibility when, in fact, they have trouble making ends meet for their, for their own citizens. And it always tends to be, does it not, the poorer countries that host the most stateless people. I'll come back to you in a minute, Julia, on that one, but Abba, what about that? Uh, it I mean, is the poorer country, isn't it? So the Bangladesh question is actually quite an interesting one. And certainly if you look at what happened post-2017, when uh, close to a million Rohingya across the border fleeing genocide, 
Bangladesh did open its borders to the Rohingya. But if you take a longer view of history, you have a situation of Bangladesh denying protection to the Rohingya. It may have opened its border uh, to take them in, but in terms of ending their statelessness... That's my point. My, my point is it's, 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 an, it's an easy paradigm of portraying Bangladesh as the, as the, the victim state bearing the burden and Myanmar as the, as the state that is uh, completely at fault. And Myanmar definitely is completely at fault, but Bangladesh also has a responsibility as does Malaysia, as does Saudi Arabia and India, and many countries in the West yeah. which have collectively failed the Rohingya. Now what, do, do, is there something you need to say? Yeah, I think that's um, uh, it is part of the either targeting the certain group due to the, they are minorities or due to the political reasons or due to the sectarian issues and or sometimes due to the ethnic uh, issues. And this is, should be dealt with the UN. UNHCR, Melanie, um, the R stands for refugees. But not all stateless people are refugees, and not all refugees are stateless people. So why is the concentration of news coverage on the refugees rather than 10 million people worldwide? I think that largely has to do with the visibility of the Rohingya. Um, you know, as, as we've said, starting in 2017, there was a mass exodus to Bangladesh that obviously caught a lot of media attention. They happen to be the largest single known stateless population on the planet. But you're absolutely right. Most stateless people are not refugees. Most stateless people are in the place that they were born and have lived their whole life. And the easiest solution is for the state hosting them to provide nationality. You know, back to the point that others were just making, the technical solutions are easy. It's only a question of political will. Again, you know, I would differentiate this from the yeah. refugee problem. It, it, so, again, you know, sorry to butt in, but it, are at hand. It, it's all very well to say there needs to be political will. But if countries that have strip people of their citizenship aren't willing to do it. You have to find ways of, of putting pressure on them. And how, how do you go about that, Melanie? Absolutely. I mean, what we try to do, among other things, is make, you know, kind of evidence-based case. The cost of providing citizenship to people on your territory who don't have it, and the example of Kyrgyzstan, just over 13,000 people, as you mentioned in your opening, the costs of providing citizenship are low compared to the opportunity costs of not providing citizenship to people who are on your territory anyway and are going to be disenfranchised and marginalized. So we try to make the evidence-based case. We point to the international standards, including the statelessness conventions. The sustainable development agenda is very helpful because there the international community made a clear commitment to leave no one behind. Nobody is farther behind than stateless people. But you're making a moral argument here and a practical one, perhaps, if you say, look, you know, these people could be good for you rather than a problem. You're making a moral and a practical argument. You are not hurting these countries where they might feel it the most, which, which could be in terms of putting pressure on them financially. Well, certainly, as UNHCR, we don't have the power to do that. But we would encourage states to advocate with each other um, and to, you know, yeah. use both carrots, carrots and sticks. Because, as you say, you know, in some cases, states that are producing statelessness are exporting a kind of global um, public threat, if you like. Mm. Um, so I do think it is in states' interest to advocate strongly with each other. Well, talking about exporting statelessness, there's a recent case of the UK stripping citizenship from this fellow, Jack Letts. He's a British citizen, born British citizen, parents are British citizens. So the UK is saying it's not in the public interest for him to come back because he's been involved with terrorism. So what are they going to do? Um, either leave him stateless in Syria or what they're claiming is he's not actually stateless because he could get to be Canadian. He could claim Canadian citizenship because his father originally came from Canada. Well, why should Canada be responsible for this fellow? Just because the UK has Okay, so, so Canada says we don't want him either, then he's stateless. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and but what he is is stranded just... in Syria. Now, you're just storing up trouble for the future. You have more and more people who don't, who don't have any loyalty to a place because they've been they've been already disowned. So okay. how can they be loyal to a country that's disowned them? Julia, um, thank you very much, and, and you, Melanie, for the time being. Amal, I stopped you as you were about to say something. I hope you can remember what it was. Yes, I can. I want to just pick up on the, on the point about political will. Uh, and often it's not the case that there is a lack of political will, but actually the political will is, the, is to the contrary. 
to, to sustain and, and kind of uh, perpetuate statelessness. Because if you look at the large groups who are stateless in the world, the Rohingya, Dominicans of Haitian origin, ethnic Russians in Latvia, and I can go on, there are, there are many such groups. These are, they tend to be minority communities where the state uh, has a vested interest in excluding them. Uh, and making these people stateless is part of often a much longer term strategy which, which to deny and exclude. Which brings me back to my, my original opening point, which is, uh, you know, you're going to find it jolly difficult to get this done uh, by 2024. Yes, certainly, but perhaps at any time in the future. I mean, I certainly can't speak for UNHCR, but uh, the way I view the I Belong campaign is not so much in terms of statelessness actually ending in 2024, but in terms of the, the fantastic... Uh, job the campaign has done in raising the visibility of the issue. No, I and I, I compare this to the Millennium Development Goals, which did this to the issue of poverty and development in the 1990s. Yeah. The more uh, you shine a light on something, the more it is talked about. Yeah, I think we have a special portrait for so, so um, many important rights, but part of it, which I think that this could be discussed in the, in the coming uh, session of, of October, and part of it, certain amendment we don't with, to this Stateliness Convention, that we can make it a little bit more details, more expanded that, to be obliged to the countries to, to, to sign it. And third one, I think, time comes to be there is name and shame. So these countries who are going against this policy of I belong, which they are increasing the number of the stateliness by revoking nationality, or at least they don't care whatever the stateliness number of the people, like in Kuwait, for example. In Kuwait, we have so many Bedouin, stateless people. More than 200,000 people are without any nationality. So, you, so at the end, I think that action to be taken by UN for them than just advocacy and campaign. But you see, you then come back to the point, if you talk about naming and shaming, you come back to the point, uh, as Amal just said, that actually the political will isn't there, therefore these countries are not necessarily going to be feeling ashamed of what they're doing because they think it is, it is necessary, it is vital. And we can come back to the case of Jack Letts, mm -hmm. uh, the Briton who fought in, in Syria, who's been stripped of his citizenship. Uh, Melanie, how do you convince countries that what they think is right, in many cases, is wrong, in your opinion? I mean, look, it's an ongoing struggle. I will be honest about it. You know, the, the most important objective is to slowly get all the states in the international community inside the tent on the international standards. There is a set of international standards which if everybody was following them would wipe out statelessness within a generation. And we have seen progress. You know, I think we have to be honest about that too. There are lots of worrying trends. Um, certainly the, the topic that's come up here with respect to deprivation of citizenship as a counterterrorism measure is a worrying trend, especially as counterterrorism mm. tends to be rather loosely defined and there's not much but, but evidence you, you are viewing good counterterrorism. You are viewing it from the outside. If you view it from the inside of any one of these situations, whether it be the Rohingya uh, or whether it, in fact, be Jawad here, the people who made this decision regard him, you, as a troublemaker. They don't want to go back on this. Well, I, I don't know. I think this distinction between the outside and inside isn't so neat as you make it sound. We've certainly seen civil society groups, you know, acting in partnership with us, for example, and with other states, putting pressure on states from the inside. And we've seen that be okay. very effective when it comes to, for example, the elimination of gender discrimination from nationality laws, which is an entirely positive trend. You know, there I think we can say we will see an end to gender discrimination and nationality laws in our lifetime. We've seen 13 states just in the last 15 years make their nationality law gender neutral. Two just since the campaign was launched. We still have 25 to go, but we've not have a, had a single state on the planet make their nation, nationality law regressive when it comes to gender in decades. Okay, J Julia, jump, jump in at any time you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm listening. Yeah, I think one problem with the way we're talking about this issue is that we're giving the impression that statelessness happens to unfortunate people, people in poor countries, people who are minorities. And there is a really important development with respect to uh, digital IDs and documentation of legal identity, which is taking off around the world. Uh, everyone, every country is getting new ID cards, perhaps legitimately. Uh, to take advantage of new technologies. The problem is that this is essentially 
making everyone prove their citizenship over again. And a lot of people are losing, effectively losing citizenship just because they can't get the latest generation of ID. And if, if people understood statelessness is not just something that happens uh, as a deliberate uh, violation of rights of specific groups, but it could potentially happen to almost everyone, okay. because how many of us are really able to prove our citizenship. Yeah. We never think that we have to, and so we're not prepared to. And we're just lucky that we're living in states that aren't trying to take our citizenship away. But indeed, you know, it can happen to virtually anyone. We assume our governments are, the wealthy countries have rule of law, it won't happen, but it, it's happened to Jack Letts, right? Okay, I, I've say, got to move, we're, we're sort of slightly running out of time, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I wanted to ask you, um, I'll, we, Michelle mentioned, um, and so did you, sort of some of the places where we, there are major problems, but uh, from what I understand, one of the next biggest difficulties could come in Assam, that is in northeastern India, yeah. what's going on there? I was just actually about to, to make the point in, 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 in uh, relation to what Julia said, uh, and there it's not a question of digital ID, but it's a question of the national registry of citizenship being... Uh, renewed and people having to again establish their links to, to India. And in the process, uh, over uh, up to 4 million people are currently excluded from the registry. And, Where are and they right now? They are in Assam. Yeah. Uh, and they are at risk of statelessness. And when the process expires, which is at the end of this month, so just a few days away, uh, unless there's a further extension, and there have been a few, we will be in a situation where there will be potentially up to 4 million people who are stateless. And the, this is worrying in itself. Is that a bureaucratic hitch or is it something that is being conveniently dressed up as sort of modernization because they don't want these people to have So there's, there's a long history uh, to what's kind of currently playing out in Assam, a long history of nationalism, of uh, ethno-nationalism, of... Islamophobia. And Narendra Modi's government is, uh, is, is very nationalistic at the moment. It is, so and... It's accused of being happy to see definitely, minorities... Definitely, and the danger okay. is that there's just been a gazette notification in India, uh, which, if seen through, would see the Assam process also being uh, replicated throughout the country. Judge Howard, how do you hope uh, to get your citizenship back? If Bahrain says no... How do you hope to get it back? Any realistic possibility? We know that you, UN's mechanism is not that much powerful to impose it over such countries like Bahrain, but there are international allies of Bahrain who are protecting Bahrain a lot in the international conventions uh, meeting and so on, and, and by name it, UK and United States. But, and, but if the United States isn't doing anything about it, and it has one of its biggest fleets there, yes. and Bahrain's quite happy to have its fleet there, gets loads of money for it, if the United States can't help in that situation, where do you turn? Definitely, we are trying our best as in NGOs and the rest of the NGOs uh, to, to do the, the, their best. But once again, without any political will internationally, especially once again by the uh, uh, international allies of Bahrain, UK and, and United States, UK invested a lot over the what they call quote unquote reforms in Bahrain and part of it human rights reforms. Which so is what you were arguing for yeah. as, as and, and a if, member of the yes, opposition. If they party. are so serious, at least they can impose it on Bahrain to start a reforms in Bahrain and part of it stop revoking nationality and give citizenship to all statelessness. But this is the, I mean, this is the, the, the wall that we always hit. So everyone has the right to a nationality. It's, it's recognized in international human rights instruments. And if you are stateless, that means your right to a nationality has been denied. But when it comes to advocacy to, to get nationality for people who've been wrongfully denied their nationality, ultimately you are up against the state. And if the state does not wish to grant nationality, yeah. then you, you are kind of at the mercy of international diplomacy. I, I hate to boil it down to this, and it may but, sound a little bit banal, but I mean, in, in effect, what Amal is saying, uh, Melanie, last word to you, is that this is all so much hot air. Well, I don't think he's quite saying that. I think he's recognizing that, you know, we do have, again, we have standards enshrined in the International Human Rights Treaties and the Statelessness Conventions. The challenge is to get everybody in the tent and get everybody implementing them. But we do have to recognize that there has been significant progress over recent decades when it comes to getting more states 
signed up to those international standards. We're not there yet, and I don't mean to pretend to say that we will be there tomorrow or even necessarily by 2024, but that is the work. The work is the ongoing advocacy, the partnership with people in these countries, including affected people, civil society organizations, getting diplomatic pressure brought to bear, and there are states that do bring diplomatic pressure to bear um, on their neighboring states. We have seen that. Um, and we we have to just keep doing this work to get the international standards. I understand. Listen, they are simple. I thank you. I have thank each and every one of you for coming on the program. It, it is a little Melanie like uh, ending slavery. It didn't didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in a matter of decades. But it happened because people started talking about it, and it became a very important international issue. The saddest thing, of course, is that while we've been on air with this program, there will have been more stateless people, men, women, and many of them children that have been added to the register of those who have nowhere that they can call home, for now at least. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the programme. Thank you for watching. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, bye-bye. <laughs>